Crunchyroll's On Equinox series has finally premiered, and with it brings to many viewers what might be their first in-depth look into Mesoamerican lore. There really haven't yet been many shows or stories that faithfully adapt the legends from these civilizations and cultures, especially compared to what we've been getting recently with the Greek pantheon. I thought I would take the opportunity to explain everything I believe you should know about the show either before checking it out or if you are a bit confused after watching. This is by no means a comprehensive look into Mesoamerica, nor is it intended to be a detailed breakdown onto every little detail in the first few episodes, but should be enough to get you interested into looking into it more, if the show hasn't done that job already. As a disclaimer, while making this video, it was announced that the rest of the season would air on the same date, meaning that it's pretty likely by the time you're seeing this, the entire first season will be out. If this video interests you, please go and watch the entire series on Crunchyroll. It's completely free, and you don't even need an account to watch. This video will only cover events shown in the trailers and the first few episodes, so it should be safe to watch for most people who are new to the show. Before making this video, I knew very little about Mesoamerican culture and lore, and honestly, I still do. So that's why I was super lucky to get some help from someone that really knows their stuff. And I also got help with pronouncing things, so if it sounds different from how the show says certain words, that's likely why. Either that, or my pronunciation was still terrible. And with all that said, let's get started. In the world of Onyx Equinox, the gods are facing a shortage of blood, leading to some gods going to the human world and seeking cities and gathering the blood of their inhabitants. Not all the gods are happy about this, however, and two of them make a bet, choosing the most lowly mortal, an Aztec boy named Mizel, to see if he can close the five gates of the underworld and save humanity. Now, this is just probably the simplest description I have of the show I could give, as there is so much more that needs to be explained. But before I get into the characters, lore, and everything else about the show, I need to explain the setting. Unlike Avatar The Last Airbender, which everyone likes to compare Onyx Equinox to, this show was made to exist in actual time and place, pre-Columbian Mesoamerica. Like the Fertile Crescent, which gave rise to Egypt and Mesopotamia, ancient China and India, and the Andes in South America, Mesoamerica, which is usually defined as the bottom half of Mexico and all of Guatemala and Belize, is one of the areas which independently gave rise to urban cities, formal governments, and other things which people traditionally associated with complex civilization. While most people are probably only familiar with Aztec and Maya, there are dozens of other major civilizations. A key point that Sophia Alexander, Honest Equinox's creator and showrunner, has raised in interviews is that it's important for her to show and explore these other cultures and civilizations across its long history, which actually stretches back almost 3,000 years before contact with Europeans. Mesoamerican history is generally spent to three periods, the pre-classic period, from 2000 BC to 200 AD, which has the development of complex societies, writing and urbanization, the classical period from 280 to 900 AD, by which point city-states and kingdoms have become widespread throughout Mesoamerica, and the post-classic period, from 980 to 1521, which begins after the decline of many influential political centers in the classical period and resulting political and demographic shifts, and continues up until the arrival of the Spanish. However, it is worth noting that even as Spanish colonization began, many areas kept their society and culture for a time, or remained unconquered for centuries. Even today, there are millions of indigenous people in Mexico, Guatemala, and Belize, belonging to many of the cultures mentioned below, who still speak their languages and retain some cultural traditions, but sadly face discrimination. Well, for the most part, Onyx Equinox seems to be depicting Mesoamerica sometime in the late classic to early post-classic, uses cultures and civilizations from across the three periods, even if it's ahistorical, which we'll discuss below. One of the earliest complex Mesoamerican societies is the Olmec, who were centered around what's now southeastern Veracruz, with sites like San Lorenzo and La Venta from 1400 to 900 BC, being some of the first to feature large-scale architecture and signs of rulership. Today, the Olmec are best known for their large stone head sculptures, and in Onyx Equinox are represented as an ancient civilization that left behind advanced magical technology. The Zapotec and Mixtec civilizations were two major cultures in what's now the Mexican state of Oaxaca, who also originated in the pre-classic. The Zapotec city of Monte Alban, or as it's known in Onyx Equinox by one of its potential Zapotec names, Daniban, was possibly the first formal political state in Mesoamerica, and would continue to be a major political center in Oaxaca for over the next 1,000 years. In the late classic and moving into the post-classic, the closely related Mixtec civilization takes over many key Zapotec cities, with the warlord Eight Deer Jaguar Claw forming a large empire. Both cultures had oracles organizing political marriages and wars, and practice ancestor worship. The Mixtec were also renowned artisans, with their metalwork and stone mosaics being widely traded. Teotihuacan was a major city-state in central Mexico in the early to mid-classical period before its decline around 600 AD. At its height, it was one of the largest cities in the world at the time, 
covering 37 square kilometers and housing 150,000 denizens belonging to many different ethnicities, including Mayas and Zapotecs, almost all of whom lived in what would have been large villas for nobility in other cities. Its ruins were so impressive, the later Aztecs would work the site into their own mythology. Teotihuacan had wide political and cultural influence, even conquering Maya city-states over 1,000 kilometers away, like Tikal. While the Maya had existed since the early pre-classic periods, it's during the classical period that they built the cities they're most known for, with hundreds of cities and towns all over the Yucatan Peninsula. Many of these cities had large sprawls, with the jungle that's now around the ruins you see having been landscaped suburbs and managed forest groves in their heyday. The Maya also had the most complex Mesoamerican writing system, with the Maya script being a complete, true written language. Maya cities were organized into kingdoms, controlled by political dynasties. The two largest, the Mutal and Khan dynasties, were headed by the cities of Tikal and Kalakmul, respectively, with Kalakmul seen in Onyx Equinox as one of its potential Maya names, Oshtetun, which engaged in a series of direct and proxy wars in the 6th to 8th centuries, before the large cities in the southern and central Yucatan Peninsula, like Tikal and Kalakmul, collapsed. Though many cities in the northern Mayan area, such as Uxmal and Chichen Itza, survived into the post-classic period. The Aztec originated as a group of nomads from outside Mesoamerica in northern Mexico, being groups of Chichimeca tribes who spoke a common language, Nahuatl. These Nahuatl groups migrated into central Mexico, centered around what is today Mexico City, in the 13th and 14th centuries, adopting Mesoamerican-style urbanism and statehood. After a series of wars and conflicts, Tenochtitlan, a city-state founded by one of the most recently arrived Nahuatl groups, the Mexica, allied with the fellow Nahuatl cities of Texcoco and Tlacopan, to overthrow the then most dominant city in their valley in 1428, with that alliance and the subjects they conquered over the next century as they expanded being the Aztec Empire. Today, the term Aztec is variously used to refer to the Nahuatl culture as a whole, the Mexica specifically, or that empire. While the Aztec today are most known for sacrifices, they also had exceptional public health and sanitation practices, as well as highly developed medical and botanical science, with botanical gardens to study plants for medical use and even categorizing them into formal taxonomic systems. At its height, Tenochtitlan housed as many as 250,000 people, roughly as much as the largest cities in Europe at the time, and was built on a lake with a series of canals like Venice. Lastly, in what today's the Mexican state of Michoacan, a group of Chichimeca also immigrated in, and integrated into the ruling class of Purepecha cities there, which also developed into a large empire in the 15th century. The Purepecha Empire would repel numerous Aztec invasions, forming a fortified border and a more centralized imperial structure than most other large Mesoamerican states, as well as being the region's largest center of bronze production. One of the most impressive things about the show is the commitment to authenticity it has when depicting these cultures. The specific style of clothing and architecture for each culture is accurately represented, with Don Yvon having distinctly Zapotec accents on buildings, or the Puk-style Maya release in Uxmal, alongside utilizing iconography and designs that play into their actual symbolism in each culture's art and religion. There's frankly enough that we can make an entire video just on the show's use of Mesoamerican art motifs. The Mesoamerican civilizations mentioned above, as well as others we didn't talk about, tend to share a few traits. Instead of wheat or rice as a grain, their primary cereal crop was maize, or corn, alongside other crops like chilies, beans, squashes, and tomatoes. Tacos, tamales, and tortillas all date back to these cultures. They lack domesticated animals like horses, pigs, and cattle for food, or as beasts of burden for labor, and by extension, didn't use wheeled carts either. They also mainly use stone and wood tools rather than metal ones, despite having gold, silver, copper, and bronze metallurgy. And despite all this, they managed amazing things. Mesoamerican civilizations could reach incredible sizes. As previously mentioned, both Teotihuacan and Tenochtitlan had populations in the hundreds of thousands, while some of the larger Maya cities had suburban sprawls that could cover hundreds of square kilometers. In general, unlike Eurasian cities, which tended to be inside a set area, Mesoamerican cities were usually organized around a core of palaces, temples, plazas, and other administrative, communal, and religious structures, which were richly painted and furnished, surrounded by a set of suburbs for commoners interspersed by agricultural land, which radiated out from the core. Many larger cities in the region had a complex series of aqueducts, canals, reservoirs, and other water management systems, sometimes even toilets and plumbing. Most Mesoamerican cultures had a base 20 numeral system, unlike our modern base 10 system, and both a 365-day solar calendar and a 260-day ritual calendar used for astrology. Many astrological records were kept in paper books, which were also used to record political records using a variety of different writing systems depending on the specific culture. And much like how Eurasian civilizations had archetypical gods and myths, such as patriarchal sky or thunder gods and primordial water serpents, Mesoamerican civilizations had archetypical deities, such as feathered serpent deities and rain gods with fangs or goggles around the eye, 
as well as shared creation myths. The most infamous element of Mesoamerican religions, and perhaps Mesoamerica as a whole, was blood worship and sacrifice. Both the importance of blood and the shared creation myths are key to Onyx Equinox's story. We've remade humanity four times before. One of the major creation myth archetypes seen across different Mesoamerican cultures is the idea that the world or its people had been cyclically created and destroyed multiple times by the gods. For example, in the Popo Vu, a document on Kiichi Maya mythology and history, the gods create first animals and then people made out of mud, wood, and finally maize. However, the cyclical creation myth Onyx Equinox most resembles is that of the Aztec Five Sons myth. In this myth, the world and its people have been created and destroyed four previous times, often with each world overseen by a god acting as the world's son, with the current age being the fifth. This myth has many variations, but most commonly, the first world had the god Tezcatlipoca acting as the sun, and the world and its people were consumed by jaguars. The second world's son was Quetzalcoatl, and it was destroyed by immense winds, and the surviving people became monkeys. The third world's son was Tlaloc, which was destroyed by a rain of fire, its survivors becoming turkeys. The fourth son was the goddess Chalchutlikue, and it was destroyed by a flood, with its people becoming fish. In trailers for the show, we can see monsters resembling monkeys, as well as a rain of light, which tie into these cataclysms. There's a bit more variation between the tellings of this myth for how the fifth current world was made. But something we suspect that will be key to Onyx Equinox is that in some, Quetzalcoatl, along with his Nawa Xolot, traveled to the underworld, Miklan, and tricked its ruler, Mikantakutli, into giving them humanity's bones, so humanity could be remade into the new world, made from the bones and Quetzalcoatl's blood. As for its son, the gods assembled at Teotihuacan, and gods stepped up to offer themselves to a fire to become it. The lowly, sickly, Nanawat, and the pompous Texi Tecat. While Texi Tecat hesitated, Nanawat dived in, Texi Tecat only following after, both arising as sons. In response to his cowardice, the other gods threw a rabbit at Texi Tecat's son, imprinting a rabbit onto it and dimming it to become the moon. The other gods then sacrificed themselves, giving their blood to allow the sun to move throughout the sky. Sacrifice is heavily misunderstood as an element of Mesoamerican societies, often being presented as acts of sadism or with massively exaggerated numbers. In reality, sacrifices were limited to specific ritualistic occasions, and in fact, the majority of blood offerings were from non-fatal bloodletting. The blood would often be soaked onto a piece of paper, which was then burned, an act we see in episode 1 of the show. And rather than being an act of bloodthirsty hedonism, as was addressed with creation myths, it tied into a broader cosmological understanding of the world and the relationship between life and death. Much like how the gods gave their own blood to animate the sun, or how Quetzalcoatl had to travel the land of the dead to retrieve humanity's bones and give his blood to create them. Or like in some versions of the Maya myth, the maize people were made from ground corn and the blood of the gods. Humanity had in turn to give their own blood to repay that debt. In Onyx Equinox, there has been a drought of blood, with the gods not receiving enough to sustain themselves, resulting in some gods assaulting cities and forcibly sacrificing people, erupting conflict throughout the pantheon. There was never going to be enough blood for all of us. Many of the gods mentioned above show up in Onyx Equinox. Miklantakutli, the Aztec god of death and lord of the underworld, is the god that instigates the blood war, sinking the city of Daniban for the blood of its inhabitants. Miklantakutli is associated with owls and the astrological day sign of dog, and other animals associated with death. While Lalok, the Aztec god of rain and storms, and one of the aforementioned goggled or fanged rain gods, hasn't shown up yet. His Zapotec equivalent, Kosiho, can be seen guarding Daniban from monsters, along with Zhou, the Zapotec god of wilderness. Two other unnamed gods show up in episode 1. We believe that these are the Aztec gods Hipe Totec and Huitzilopochtli, for reasons that will be explained in the pinned comment. However, the two gods seemingly most important to Onyx Equinox's story are Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca, who make a bet seeing if the most pathetic human can close the five gates of the underworld. Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca are often portrayed as rivals in Aztec mythology. In some creation myths, they bring the world into existence for the first time via slaying the primordial monster Sipakli and making the world from its corpse. Both also destroyed the prior versions of the world that the other oversaw. Quetzalcoatl struck Tezcatlipoca's son with a stone club, enraging him to transform into a jaguar that devoured the world's people. And in the second world, Tezcatlipoca is said to have either transformed its people into monkeys after they stopped worshipping the gods, or causing the wind which blew them away. Another incident anime fans may be familiar with is, as is told in Dragon Maid, where Tezcatlipoca drugged Quetzalcoatl, who ended up violating his sister afterwards. Quetzalcoatl is probably the god you're most familiar with, 
and his archetype, the Feathered Serpent, which represents the duality and boundary of the heavens and the earth, has one of the longest histories of any Mesoamerican deities. Early versions of what's thought to be feathered serpents can be seen as early as the Olmec site of La Venta. At Teotihuacan, one of the city's largest pyramids was devoted to the god, where it had aquatic associations. Among the Aztec, Quetzalcoatl was heavily associated with the legendary ruler of the prior semi-mythical Toltec civilization, named Se Acatopiltzin, to the point where many things written about one are ascribed with the other. Both Quetzalcoatl and Topiltzin are associated with popularizing poetry, laws, music, theology, and civilization to humanity, and in general is usually portrayed as being more benevolent to humanity than most gods. This is commented on in episode 1 by Tezcatlipoca, as well as in the aforementioned Aztec creation myth when he traveled to Miklan to retrieve humanity's bones. Additionally, one of Quetzalcoatl's aspects was the wind god Ehecat. A signature iconographic element of Quetzalcoatl and Ehecat was a cross-section conch pendant known as a wind jewel, or the name you see on screen, with conches being associated with sound, wind, speech, and music. In Honest Equinox, we see the boy Quetzalcoatl possesses with a conch on his hip, and in the trailer, there's a shot where Quetzalcoatl wears the pendant, alongside other key iconographic traits, such as a conical hat and a beak mask. Tezcalipoca, by contrast, has no particular fondness for humanity. While not evil, he's capricious and dangerous, associated with things such as jaguars, the night, sorcery, strife, and the fickle nature of fate. He's a trickster, such as in the aforementioned case where he drugged Quetzalcoatl, or in other accounts of Toltec history where he seduces the Toltec ruler Waymac. A particular association of his was with divination with obsidian mirrors, which were seen as a gateway to the spirit world or afterlife, with the omens given by the mirror represented in art as a smoke, similar to the way speech was depicted in Aztec art. Accordingly, Tezcatlipoca's name in Nahuatl means smoking mirror, and in Onyx Equinox, there is smoke perpetually billowing from his mouth. You can also see the ghostly or skeletal leg he got chomped off by Sipakli in the show. One of Tezcatlipoca's aspects in Aztec legend is Yaut, and in Onyx Equinox, he is reconceptualized as Tezcatlipoca's emissary, who is fittingly a giant jaguar who can also summon a giant mirror on his back. Yaut is ordered by Tezcatlipoca to oversee humanity's champion, selected by Quetzalcoatl for their bet, a boy named Izel. Izel and his sister Nelly are the two main characters we're introduced to in episode 1. Despite living in Uxmal, a Maya city, they're Aztec, from the city of Tenochtitlan, seemingly slaves or serfs. The specific social classes differ depending on the culture and even specific city, but slaves in Mesoamerican societies generally had more rights than our modern idea of slavery. People selling themselves into slavery temporarily to pay off debts was common, for example. However, slaves could be sacrificed in specific situations, which is likely why Izel was initially chosen to be sacrificed. After Nelly chooses to replace Izel as a sacrifice, Izel falls into a deep depression and attempts to commit suicide. Even after being chosen by the gods, he wants to give up on life and let humanity die. In the companion podcast, Sophia and other staff on the show have said that this is influenced by real-life mental illness. There may be parallels here between Izel's emotional arc and Aztec philosophy. In Aztec thought, life and death were seen as complementary, rather than opposed, in a self-sustaining cyclical relationship. The world and humanity had been cyclically created and destroyed, with the gods sacrificing themselves to recreate it. The animals and plants created by the gods consume one another and the sun's rays or rain to survive. People consume plants and animals to live, and the gods consume people via sacrifice. Death and sacrifice was seen as a natural part of life, and the inherent transience of life was a major theme in Aztec poetry. Another major theme seen in Aztec moral adages was the notion that failure and hardship was a natural part of life. To live a good life was not to be free of hardship, but to accept life's pitfalls and seek to navigate through them, and to help others through them as well. Morals were communal. Izel's rejection of not just his own life in the face of greater hardship, but of his fellow man, goes against the ideal of virtue in Aztec thought, and this may play into his emotional arc. The other main human character we're introduced to in the first two episodes is Zianya. Zianya is a Zapotec girl from Daniban, who managed to escape its destruction by Miklan Tecutli. Not much was revealed about her in the first few episodes, but we know that she's athletic and enjoys sparring, and based on the trailers is going to be an active fighter. While a woman fighting as a warrior would have been unusual, women could be in more positions of authority in the Zapotec and the closely related Mixtec society than some other Mesoamerican civilizations such as the Aztec. Zapotec queens were able to wield considerable influence, and female Zapotec and Mixtec gods are depicted in combat in art and surviving books. 
Sophia Alexander has also confirmed that in earlier versions of Awning Equinox, Xianya was originally a man, and was at one point considered to be a mushe, a gender and social identity concept seen in Zapotec culture, with similar concepts being found in other Mesoamerican cultures, which had both male and female associations, or didn't fit clearly into a gender binary. The next two characters we are introduced to are the brothers Jun and Kin, who are raised by Izel's strange caretaker in the Maya city of Oshtetun, also known as Kalakmul. Arrogant and confident, they're skilled ball players who see their destiny tied to the legendary Maya hero twins, Hanapu and Shablanke. The Maya hero twins play a large part in the Popol Vuh, their story taking up the majority of the document. After the previously mentioned unsuccessful attempts to make humans out of mud and wood, the gods Hun Hanapu and Vakub Hanapu are challenged to a ball game by the lords of Shivalba, the Maya underworld. However, they are repeatedly tricked and eventually sacrificed, with the former's head being placed inside a tree, which impregnates an underworld princess. After a series of exploits, she escapes and gives birth to the hero twins, who grow up and have their own escapades, eventually also being challenged by the underworld gods. Unlike their predecessors, they have smart the underworld gods, best Shibalba's many challenges, such as rooms of flying knives or jaguars, and retrieve Hun Hanapu's remains. The illusions between Jun and Kin and the hero twins are pretty clear. Both are Maya, twins, and are ball players. Jun and Kin's names are also referencing the Sun and Moon, and both Hanapu and Shablanke become the Sun and Moon in Popovu at the end of their adventures. In a trailer, we also see Jun fall into a black void, perhaps into the underworld, potentially mirroring elements in the Popovu. The last major human character that will travel with Izel is Shinastaku. We know the least about her of the main cast, just that she seeks to redeem herself from a dark past, which was mentioned in press releases. However, Shinastaku seems to belong to the Totonak culture, as in Awning Equinox's opening, she can be seen by the city of Deltahin, and in the ending, can be seen with the instrument used in the Danza de los Voladores, a modern festival practiced by the Totonac people with broader Mesoamerican roots. She's also seen with white feathers around her in the opening, which combined with the mysterious heron seen in the end of episode 2, might suggest Shinastaku is a Nagual. This is a complex subject that we can't fully do justice in this video, but a Nagual is a Nahuatl term for a broader concept across many Mesoamerican civilizations for a shapeshifter, who is linked to a familiar or spirit twin creature based on the day sign one was born under in the ritual calendar that they can also transform into. This ties in nicely with our two non-human characters in Izel's party other than Yaut, being Meke and Kiik. While Kiik is probably not a Nagual, its design is taken from anthropomorphized designs depicting knives in Central Mesoamerican art, especially for the knife or flint day sign. Interestingly, despite being based on Central Mesoamerican art, it calls out for blood in the Yucatec Maya word for blood, which is also what it's named after. Sophia says it's because it was in the northern Maya area by Uxmal and wants to be understood. Meanwhile, McKay is a magical axolot, or axolotl as it's pronounced in the show, seen in trailers. In real life, axolots are amphibians native to the former lakes of the Valley of Mexico, today shrunk to only a few surviving canals around Xochimilco in Mexico City due to the Spanish draining the lakes over time. Axolot are also associated with the Aztec god god Xolo, where it is said he transformed into reeds, Caba maze, and an axolot to hide and escape when the god sacrificed himself in Teotihuacan to usher in the fifth world. Xolot was associated with deformities and twins, which were both viewed as ill omens, and was described in the Nagua form of Quetzalcoatl, who followed him to the underworld to retrieve humanity's bones, and is likely the twin Tezcatlipoca mentions in episode 1 that served Mikantakuli in the underworld. We wonder if Meke is somehow related to Sholo as a result. There is one last character to cover, so far only known as the healer, and could be seen in marketing materials as well as the opening, and spying on events from the background in episodes 1 and 2. The healer seems to be the goddess Mitekakwat, wife of Mikantakuli, in disguise. In trailers and in the opening, she's seen with marigolds, a flower associated with the goddess. There's also a shot in one of the trailers which seems to show Miteka Kuat in the regalia she is depicted with in manuscripts. However, only time will tell for sure. And that pretty much covers it. If you enjoyed watching and want more Onyx Equinox content, please let us know in the comments section. And for something to talk about, comment about your favorite character in the show. Anyways, thank you all so much for watching it all the way through. It was a real labor of love that took quite a while to get made. But I definitely did not do this alone, as I knew next to nothing about Men's America when I started this video. Majora Z helped me out so much by not only doing a ton of the research, but giving me a huge document of notes. But he also provided pictures to use and so much more. Check out his Twitter page and give him a follow, and be sure to check out the pinned comment to see some extra information that we weren't able to fit in the video. Zot's comic on Twitter helped me with pronunciation. I will also link their account, and you should definitely check out their comic. And the stunning artwork used for the thumbnail was made by my friend Snowflake Owl. She's a super talented artist, so please go give her a follow on her Twitter. 
Finally, if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing. The gods would want you to. You can also help support the channel further by becoming a patron. It helps keep the channel going to ensure we make more awesome videos like this. Have an animated day.